Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, Community Update is the nice na name for this, this webinar, but uh, State of the Nation is uh, also another title that's been banded around. My name is Dave West. Uh, I'm a member of the Steering Committee, and I'm very excited to um, introduce the Steering Committee uh, to, uh, onto this uh, webinar today. Um, a group of people that work tirelessly to pursue the um, the sort of the ideas, the community around OSLC. So uh, many of them are on today's call. Many of them will be speaking today. Um, but I'm uh, myself and John are going to be acting as as your as your hosts today, which is very very exciting because we've got a really fun packed agenda. First, we're going to start with a little bit of OSLC introduction. Uh, even though OSLC has been around for a number of years, it's very clear that a lot of people have got some misunderstanding. So it's always good to set set the stage, put some context around that. John's going to be talking about, about that. But really, today's webinar is really going to be focused on the next section, which is success stories. We're very fortunate to have a number of different people presenting and talking very briefly. Um, honestly, many of the, the success stories are so interesting, they could take up an entire webinar, but very briefly introducing a little bit about some of the success they're having with OSLC. We've got Ericsson, IBM, ourselves here at TaskTop, Mentor Graphics with Bill, we've got Airbus, and then we're going to transition, which is a Sort of success story into how we're working with other organizations and Rainy is going to be talking a lot about that which is really really exciting particularly the PLM working group which um, there's a lot of stuff happening. We're then going to move into something completely different and talk a little bit about where um, some of the ideas around integration and lifecycle integration are going with an emerging uh, working group called uh, Lifecycle Integration Patterns and how that's influencing our thinking about where OSLC is going in the future. Then, of course, there's a little bit of a how can you help slide. I'm sure throughout today's webinar, we're going to be getting many sort of questions about, okay, that's really interesting. What can I do? to contribute? What can I do to help? And so there's a section right at the end where we're going to give you some ability to contribute, tell you what's next, and tell you uh, what you can look for uh, on this uh, uh, on this sort of channel in the future. Now, as Sarah said, uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Obviously, um, myself and uh, the steering committee and everybody that's a panelist will take it, uh, pay attention to these questions. Sometimes they may be very appropriate to be asked during uh, the section, so I will take responsibility to uh, try to take those and, and ask them. However, if somebody's in mid-flow telling an interesting riveting story or having a little bit of a, a joke, I, I may save that to the end. So we'll make sure that we have some time at the end to address those particular questions. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, to John, uh, distinguished engineer at at, uh, at IBM, who uh, will take you for a little bit about OSLC. John, welcome to today's talk, and um, take it away. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, let's just start here by recognizing the world that we live in. We all use a range of tools, and on this chart you can see some of them, but but none of us live within a single tool. The reality is we're using a set of tools. And if we're working perhaps on a community project, we may be using JIRA for our uh, task tracking, Git for our source code, Jenkins for Bill for doing something has a different set of requirements. Maybe it's our personal preference. Not clear exactly why the tool sets are different uh, always. But another set, maybe I'm using DOORS, RTC, HP Quality Center, Urban Code. And, and again, those are just examples. There's any any kind of tool sets that people could use. The reality is they're there. There's something that we use for a given project as an organization and a team. I, I'll use uh, one set of tools for another project. It may be a different set. So this reality exists that there's many tool sets that are being used in different contexts. Let's go to the next chart and see what that, that encourages us to think about. So given that we have these uh, tool sets within a project, we want to be able to connect and correlate the data, the information that's coming from the individual tools. And just have just a few examples here to help us think through what we're trying to do. So I have a, a bug 
and I'm, I'm fixing that bug, so that's a, the task that I'm recording, and I have a change set. That's the code that's being built uh, to, to do the fix, and I want to be able to connect those two things. How do I do that? Well, I can connect it with a sticky note. I can connect it in my mind. I can connect it with a comment that I know the correlation to. I can connect it with a link, if that's possible. So there's a range of ways of doing it, but that importance of connecting and correlating is right there. Now, I might be connecting things uh, that come from tools that I created. It could be open source tools, could be commercial tools. And the key thing is I want to be able to connect the data. Now, sometime that connection leaves the context that I'm in. This third example is I have a project and I'm uh, building on code that came from somewhere else. Maybe I'm building on an open source code library. And that open source code library, it changes. So how do I keep track of the changes to find out about defects that are in that, dependencies, and how I can handle that? So the next reality is my project doesn't work in isolation. It's using uh, code from other places. might be uh, that I have two teams that are co-developing. So I have one building uh, a library that another is consuming. And I need to be able to keep up with the changes, make requests, cross that boundary. So that's trying to be representative of the kinds of problems that we encounter in terms of what's, what's going on across uh, various projects. So let's go to the next chart. And um, here we want to flag another class of challenges. And that is the tool sets themselves aren't static. So I don't decide what set of tools to use and then use forever, but, but rather for a project, I'll use a, a set of tools, might augment it a little bit. Another project, another another tool might come into the mix. So I'd like to, as the example shares here, uh, explore a new with a new task tracker for a new project. But while I'm trying that, I would still like to be able to connect and correlate, like I said before. So although I changed the tool set, the use cases that I had, I still care about those, and I still want to be able to work through those things. I want to be able to get a big picture view. So if I'm tracking um, maybe two projects, I'd like to be able to roll up that information to be able to understand things. So again, key point here, many different tool sets, changing and evolving tool sets, and I want to be able to make sense and be able to connect the things that come together. So does that make sense, Dave? I'll take silence. Yeah. It sure does. In fact, I think it's something that we... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, it sure does. It always takes a little bit of time to unmute, and uh, there's always building work going on outside my office, as always. But um, only when you deliver a webinar, though, do they start work. It's funny. I must know about it. But it's interesting that you, 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 you bring that up, because something that I see a lot, John, and I, is that this very growing complex tool chain, you know, bring your own device into work has kind of turned into project teams using the particular technology that makes sense to them. Uh, maybe it's a supplier, maybe it's an OEM partner, maybe it's uh, maybe it's um, a, just an internal team that just want to be cool. So this very fragmented tool chain is, is what we see. Uh, what I see every day uh, is really that's what we're trying to trying to help organizations manage, right? Absolutely. So let's go to the next chart because that's the point. OSLC is about addressing these kind of challenges that we've talked about. It's a place, and maybe this is the first way to think about OSLC, it's a place to share and solve the, these integration problems, the challenges that, that we're in here. It's sometimes just having a place to voice it um, and bounce off um, things that have worked, things that don't work, um, very helpful. So think of OSLC as a place for the conversation. OSLC is also has a technology aspect. At this point, there's an open and scalable approach to integration that enables people to be successful across these very diverse tool chains. And this next uh, chunk, um, as you mentioned in our success stories, we're going to share how a range of organizations and individuals are succeeding uh, using this technology. So this isn't just a picture. We'll, we'll show a few pictures here, but it's uh, technology that's implemented, being used, and important to what what several of us and, and others are doing. And the last point here is OSLC is uh, growing and evolving and changing and values 
your involvement. Um, those, those on this um, webinar listening in, we'd like your involvement, others nearby, and the range of involvement is significant. And there's lots of places for it here in the community as a whole. Uh, there's an open source project associated. There's standards development going on. Anyone building tools, there's uh, things that can be done there. And uh, we have a steering committee. We'll share a little bit more about these, but this is just to give the spirit of the kinds of contribution that's possible. I think, oops, go ahead, Dave. Sorry, John. I was going to say, I think that's important that, you know, to remind people that the, 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 the two most important things that OSLC is, yes, there's some great technology that's being developed and continues to evolve and, and be improved, uh, some of which is in an open source project, Eclipse Leo. But uh, that what's really interesting, what's the most important thing is this idea of community. I think it's something that we're really placing special emphasis on. Uh, and that this is definitely something the steering group is spending a lot of time worrying about because ultimately uh, as, as fabulous as any technology is it's about trying to get people together with problems to find out together the solutions maybe people have solved particular problems in certain ways and had some problems with that maybe they've got some great success and really this idea of community uh, is, uh, is is a very important one so we'll obviously be talking a lot more about that and the customer success stories or the success stories really embody some of that collaboration and community aspect Yes. So on the next chart, um, I want to touch on the technology just briefly, and all I'm going to say is, I think, three things. One is, and this is old news today, but solutions that are based on the architecture of the web are, are the ones that are strong, and the organizations that are doing that are the most effective, and the principles that we're using uh, in OSLC are based on that, tapping into um, linked data as a way to surface and uh, interact with data is, is an element of this that's, that's valuable. The idea of coming to uh, common terms so that we can work together. All, all, I would say, motherhood and apple pie. So that's pretty obvious stuff. This thought of just enough integration is an important one, which is there's a range of ways um, that we need to go about solving integration problems. And at OSLC, we're open to understanding how can we make an incremental step of progress? Is there something we can do? So this notion of a um, what we call in the past a user interface preview, a way to do a rich hover, um, so support on doing uh, delegated user interfaces. The way to do the next problem that we haven't solved, the idea is we're not locked into a pre-existing solution here. We're looking for elements that help um, users solve their integration problems. So just doing the things that make sense. The thought here, and there's a little bit of a comment here about um, trying to avoid uh, getting into the complexity of uh, certain synchronization schemes. I think it's worth realizing that there's times where there's intentional and targeted synchronization that's valuable. The thought here is we don't want to be over-focused on that. Rather, use the solutions that make sense in the place we are. Let me talk about where that collaboration occurs. Next chart. In the, in the community, there's many elements here. Some of this reflects the heritage that we, we come from, but I want to just at least introduce the various places. On the right, we have our portal at openservices.net. There's a place to see the news, what's happening, forums to interact. The, the home for the user groups are there. Um, pointers and references to the um, resources and tutorials that we have. We then have the, the work that's happening in the context of the standards. So we have a member section at OASIS and a steering committee, and that's, that's us. Um, but there's also various technical committees that are focusing on the specific uh, areas of integration and, and trying to solve those and produce uh, results that can be helped. And so the output of that technical committee work is standards. There's also a W3C standard that we've started. It's called the uh, Link Data Platform. And that work has broader interest, not just for those in who are building um, tool integration, but the thought is anyone who cares about some of those linked data concerns. So we did that standard at another place. So we have two different standards locations depending on the, the focus of the standards. And then we have the open source project, uh, the Eclipse 
uh, LEO project where there's a set of test suites that you can use to validate the, um, the quality of your OSLC integration. There's some samples and examples to work with. Um, and then there's su support, uh, whether you're trying to build in Java or .NET, some, some things out there. So anyway, this gives you kind of an overview of the places uh, where, where the collaboration is taking place. And next chart, just in passing on this next chart, wanted to flag that the um, pages that you see at OpenServices.net have had a facelift of late. They're, they're in a place that they're now um, mobile friendly. The organization's been improved. The, the web pages have a greater responsiveness. We uh, came out with a new lighter weight uh, logo that reflects uh, the spirit of the change. Clearly have much more uh, work to do on continuing to grow and evolve the content to make it helpful, but just want to give a flag that, that that work is ongoing. And the link down here to the communications work group is a work group that's focused on the task of being able to both improve the, the website, but also improve and uh, be open to uh, collaboration and communication opportunities at conferences and other places that make sense. Yeah, it's just to remind everybody that uh, this is only as good or as bad as the effort that everybody else puts into it. So this is a community effort. As John mentioned, there's a lot of nice work been happening around improving, making the website uh, more uh, mobile friendly, changing the logos, etc. But every day we're looking for more help uh, getting this to be better and to be more accessible to the rest of mankind, as it were. So thanks, John. I think that's great. So it, what we've done, what John provided with you was a little idea of what is happening with regard, what, what OSLC is, and sort of broadly some of the key things that are happening, how it fits into a broader um, architecture of, of open standards, open source projects, community activities, et cetera. I think you did a great job there, John. I know there's, there's a number of questions that popped up that I'll, I'll come back to later, because I really want to talk a little bit about now what is actually happening in the community at large and, and perhaps one of the biggest supporters of OSLC um, is a, a very, very strong technology vendor called Ericsson. Everybody's had at some point an Ericsson mobile phone and probably are talking or listening to this webinar via some part piece of Ericsson equipment uh, today. So I'd like to hand over to Ludmilla, uh, who's been driving a lot of these initiatives at Ericsson uh, and uh, give opportunity for her to spend a couple of minutes just talking a little bit about why and what uh, they're up to at Ericsson of OSLC. Ludmilla, Welcome to today's call. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, for inviting me. And I just want to say a few words about Ericsson and OSLC. Uh, we need uh, OSLC. And what about integration? Integration is about faster feedback. And we're implementing OSLC in a number of integration. Uh, and w we're getting a lot of good business case from our customers, so we have very happy customers today. But uh, we need to implement more integration. We have a lot of tools within Ericsson, uh, so we would like to implement even more integration, and um, we would like to make those cheaper and uh, quicker, and also we would like to see how we can, we can improve ways of doing integration. We also try to avoid to make the full sync. Uh, that's why we introduce something which is called lean sync, just to, to show that we, we really would like to, as much as possible, use the clean whistle -sea thinking about, let's say, linking. Uh, but we also find that uh, integration gives us possibility to make reports and dashboards to produce visualization for, and um, this is uh, something, uh, the new step in our implementation, and it's uh, we're getting a lot of cust uh, good feedback from customers in the visualization. 
So uh, we've done a number of, of um, adapters. Uh, we, we have a lot of Ericsson proprietary tools, but also we're using a lot of commercial tools. So those commercial adapters will be available as open source. And um, the, what is next for, for me today is just to try work with the Reiner and some European project, try to find a way how we can establish or find the good marketplace, how to find champions, how to build a community around uh, the OSLC and have a possibility to, to, to support this community in a better way. So this was for me. That's great. Thanks, Ludmilla. So just uh, the, the, your motive, you've got an incredibly complex engineering organization using hundreds of different tools and your motivation. Thousands. Around, you Thousands. Know, I was trying to avoid saying that because it just sounds, <laughs> that just sounds silly. But um, that's in your motivation was predominantly aimed at, at providing this sort of like thin layer thin is perhaps not the right word for it, but this very expressive layer that between all of these tools to sort of collect information to provide some level of uh, feedback um, around collaboration around these tools as you deliver your engineering projects faster and, uh, and, and cheaper. Uh, would that really sum up the, your motivation for doing OSLC and working with the OSLC community? Yeah, I mean, as I said, first the feedback, I mean, we would like to get uh, the first feedback between, let's say, product management who write the opportunities to developers uh, and uh, uh, as well to get faster feedback from our customers to development and product management. So everything is, let's say, we try to implement end-to-end -end solution. Um, and uh, right now we mostly concentrated on, uh, let's say, agile planning, opportunity, requirement management, but also we are moving to, uh, let's say, continuous development and continuous integration um, and uh, some testing part. Okay. So that it's all about getting feedback in a different way and uh, OSLC, OSLC help us to give this feedback. Excellent. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for your uh, for your observations. So I'd like to then. So that that brings us talking about feedback and 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 uh, basically getting your tools, your thousands of tools, to work together. I think I'd like to just bring John back in because th IBM has thousands of tools, both commercially and internally. So I'd love to hear what you guys are doing around OSLC and how it fits into the broader initiatives at, at IBM around digital transformation in this age of di the digital world. John. Well, the, the challenges of tool integration are a problem that's right up IBM's alley. You mentioned uh, the many pieces of software that we have and the need to integrate them. We, we have this problem in spades. And we, we see the need and the potential at the same time and observe, as we do, this is just part of IBM's lifeblood, we, we see that there's value in bringing together a community and providing an open solution and approach to this. And so that was the motivation for us to be so um, active around OSLC and to do what we could to, to support the notion from, from the earliest days. Uh, so that's the spirit of our work. I want to draw attention to two things um, in particular. One is this uh, second bullet I have here is we've been pioneering some new work in configuration management. And again, this is the problem of looking at the data that exists across tools with another lens, which is this lens of a cross-cutting configuration, taking a baseline of requirements and test cases and source code, and then being able to look across that and understand that as a single piece as opposed to a separate one. So anyway, we're pioneering some work there, and the first implementation of that uh, is in our uh, this month's CLM uh, delivery. And the, the last point here is, uh, I said that OSLC is in our, our lifeblood. We have defined our life cycle portfolio with OSLC in mind. This has been uh, in our way of thinking from the early stages. And so whether we're doing requirements management, change management, the quality management work, service desk pieces, um, other elements uh, across our life cycle portfolio, this is something that we've supported, we deliver. And um, it, it's been valuable for us and uh, a positive step 
in this integration journey. Cool. Thanks, thanks, John. I think uh, you, you guys at IBM have done a fantastic job driving some of these initiatives in, in our industry and and sort of, I don't know, uh, creating the environment to allow the community to, to grow, which is obviously a, something that IBM does fantastically well anyway, which brings us to uh, an organization that works very close to IBM and many vendors in this space, which is Tastop. I'll, I'll just speak briefly because I know I've done far too much speaking. Many people think that um, um, our Tastop Sync product wouldn't, by its very name, would not be OSLC compliant. But interestingly, Tastop, we're in the integration business. We connect the world of software delivery. And uh, we've been involved since the start. In fact, one of the first videos that OSLC produced was my um, my boss, Mick Kirsten, our, our CEO and founder, talking about the importance of open standards and OSLC. Since that very day, we've been heavily involved in OSLC, providing often a veneer, a layer on top of, dare I call them, legacy tools, some would call them asset tools, tools that have already, that, are, that, are, that have no OSLC or web kind of compliance, but, but still have got masses amounts of information. So we have the ability to create an OSLC interface from a non-OSLC tool. Um, as said earlier, I sit on the OSL steering committee with some very, very much smarter people than me, learning about the value and the importance of open standards every day. And we continue to invest in this. Our head of architecture participates extensively in the uh, technical committee. And um, recently, we took over responsibility for IBM's implementation of a number of open, a number of these OSLC interfaces for products like HP and, and Jira, so that they, um, so that they can concentrate on on actually building the systems of record. So and provide it. We provide this this video on top. It's been really interesting, and exciting. Um, and it really does, OSLC adding to other integration capabilities provides a powerful solution we have found for our customers to be, to be successful, which is, which is great. And it's also very important to build a commercial um, um, sort of a commercial drive around an open standard like OSLC uh, and uh, of which companies like Tastop uh, uh, make money and uh, deliver value to their customers from that and it's a very motivating uh, um, uh, sort of aspect to OSLC which brings us nicely I think to Mentor Graphics and to uh, one of my fellow uh, steering committee members who also has a silly accent like myself. Um, um, it depends who you, where you live, I guess, if it's silly or not. So, Bill, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing at, at Mentor Graphics and, and what you're doing with RSLC. Well, just like Tasktop, Mentor Graphics is a vendor of tools and like IBM. So we're talking here from the point of view of people who are producing commercial products usually specialized on solving a particular problem. And we've been very, very good over the years in mental graphics in producing tools that are good at their own individual problem, but not all that good at playing across disciplines and not all that good at playing across the teams people really have to build in their design worlds. And so we've been focusing over many, many cycles of innovation and new generations of tools. How do we make these tools play together better? And our industry had various initiatives. There was a Frameworks initiative 20 so years ago, and it was an idea, but it really was too rigid. It was too much integration. And I want to comment on that point that John made on earlier on, just enough integration. Provides us here through OSLC with a very efficient communication layer. That efficient communication layer makes it practical to take information from various different sources throughout the life cycle of the products our customers are trying to build and to apply that as they go through their design cycles to the tools that they already work with. So we've been able to take a whole army of non-OSLC tools, the majority of the products that we build and that many of our customers also integrate with from other vendors and give those tools an OSLC extension that lets those tools start to share information. And once we can start to share information, we can start looking at the cycle, looking at what's happening in that design process, and start to build a much more efficient design and development environment for people, where the team members can be more productive because the information they need 
can be brought to their fingertips very much more easily. An OSLC connection lets me link the design task somebody's working upon to the procedure that describes how that task should be followed, to the standard behind that procedure that sets out the regulations they're trying to meet. And so it enables teams to be more effective in getting information when they need it, using that information during their work, and sharing with the rest of the team what they've done and where they've got to in that work process. And we've been able to build through our context SDM product family, interactivity between the different actions people are performing, the design work they're working on, the project that they're working in, and all the different team members without disrupting what they're doing today because this plugs in to existing tools and gives just enough integration to be effective in this world. So Correct. Mental Graphics offers, thank you, Dave. Sorry, I was just going to say that's that's really interesting, <laughs> uh, interesting, Bill. This the word that you use, which is enabling these organisations to implement their processes in the tools that make sense to them, and is is I think it's many of the questions and comments that we're getting, it really does resonate with 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 the audience. Yeah, we're very happy to be able to make tools that were previously excellent at doing a single job now excellent at doing that in the context of the team. That makes total sense. Okay, so uh, I'd like to have some brilliant, uh, and so two commercial vendors, you've seen, heard from, from uh, or three commercial vendors, IBM, I, you never think of them as commercial because they're just like an institution, aren't they? But um, though obviously they are very commercial as well. And then Ericsson talked to me about their usage. The, the last customer success story is uh, obviously an, an organization that's very near to my heart because I spend a lot of time in the air. And we're very fortunate to have Ian uh, also has a, an English Jackson, to, uh, to talk a little bit about Airbus and what you guys are doing with respect to OSLC. Ian, tell us tell us your story. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, Hello? I can. <laughs> Great. So the Conga project was a collaboration between Airbus and a number of, number of other partners to investigate set-based design. Uh, I won't go into too much about set-based design, but it's a methodology which um, it's, it's a methodology of selecting a large number of designs or starting with a large number of designs and then whittling those designs down based on a number of parameters. And the idea is that um, instead of just beginning your design with one or two designs and then tweaking them to make them fit your requirement is that you start with a huge number of designs and then as you tighten up your models and you, 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 you play with the parameters that you're interested in, you, you whittle away the designs and you end up with maybe four or five designs which suit the needs depending on what you do. The, the different tools which we did the modeling and the analysis with in Conga, oh, by the way, this was done for, for, for future wing technology, so we were looking at developing more efficient and cost-effective aircraft. And we did this with a number of other partners, um, including Rolls-Royce, who developed the engines. Um, there was a, we worked with Cranfield University, who had a tool called Arcadia, and we also uh, worked with someone called MSC, um, using a tool called, uh, they had a tool called Sim Manager. And, and they all developed, and they had these, these tools for, for, for building their models and performing all sorts of analysis so we could do the trade-off necessary for set-based design. And this was all collaborated with or orchestrated with um, a tool called ShareSpace, which was produced by a company called Eurostep. Now, all these tools were currently integrated at the beginning of Conga using an existing technology or standard called uh, BDA, Behavioral Digital Aircraft, but we wanted to use DOORS for its, well, its, its requirements management capability, but it, it wasn't the appetite to ch either change DOORS into B to BDA compliance or make all of the other tools OSLC compliant. So we had to investigate how we could use OSLC and BDA to work together, and, what we, and it worked quite well in the end. What we were able to do was, uh, was in, because OSLC is linked database, and we were able to build the resources in the collaboration hub and embed our OSLC links into shared space. And this meant that anybody who could understand BDA requirements just through using the power of linked data now had access to the requirements as they were in their native DOORS environment. And without much knowledge, you could easily call upon the delegated UI, which gave instant access to all of the other engineering tools to the requirements in DOORS. And 
if you wanted to go one step further, there wasn't much extra effort required to update or change those requirements. Parametric requirements was something that we were particularly interested in with set-based design. At the beginning of your process, you might be aware that you have a requirement. For example, you know that you will need to specify the wingspan, but you don't know what that wingspan is going to be until further on in your design process. But you need that requirement there. So you start off at the beginning, you say the wingspan will be X, Y, Z meters long, and then you will need to come back to that and update it later on. So if we wanted to change that later um, for, uh, using Acadia, for example, um, we were able to use the, the OSLC update capability to update that requirement. And that, that worked quite well. Um, so we built a consumer application for shared space using OSLC for net. And that was, that was our gateway into, in, into doors. What we really liked about it was that, um, well, first of all, you, you don't need to do much programming at all if you just want to make use of the delegated UIs from, a, from an OSLC service provider. But also, if you do want to uh, update your requirements and use the creation factories and so on, the other capabilities of OSLC, you don't need to know the internal workings of the tool. So for us, what was really nice about us, OSLC is that when you're working with a, a, a requirements provider, you, you don't care whether the database is doing it in Oracle or Excel or Access or whatever. You, the point is you have just a few simple steps. You use HTTP commands. You need to know a few headers, and you can go ahead and do your update. And that process would be the same for any requirements provider, whether you're using DAWs or, or, so, or some other requirements provider. So, so for us, that was, that was quite nice. Cool. Well, thanks, thanks, Ian. Thanks. That's incredibly interesting. Providing that 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 glue, using OSLC to glue together these very disparate tools uh, to allow them to work in the context of the requirements that were that Doors provided for everybody. That's great. So. Hopefully, um, everybody, you've heard some interesting stories about how how uh, some organisations are using using OSLC to be successful. So I'd like to bring in Rainer, who wants to, who can talk a little bit about how uh, OSLC is connecting with um, um, different organisations, particularly ProStat. Rainer. Hi, thanks. Hi, everybody from my side as well. So uh, yeah, there was another interesting part in Ian's talk that he have the fact to, to connect different standards together. And there was recently a blog uh, and, and somebody asked, I'm fairly new in this in the operability world, uh, why should I use OSLC versus this other standard I don't recall at the moment? And my, my immediate response to this, this person was, uh, the first thing that you have to learn in this interoperability world is there is no standard A versus standard B, but a standard A together with standard B. And that's why we are looking uh, to, to grow the, the, the usefulness of OSLC and make OSLC even more better uh, connected in our uh, heterogeneous world by, by partnering with other organizations and not just saying our standard is better than your standard and, and we all have to use OSLC instead of this other stuff. So, but find a way to have all those things working seamlessly together. And uh, ProStep is an interesting organization, so she's very well connected in the automotive and aerospace uh, community. And and uh, they are mainly uh, committed to, to drive new standards for, for modern product data management and, and visual product creation. And they have created an initiative they call Code of PLM Openness where PLM stays uh, for product lifecycle management, which in this community usually means a uh, product from the beginning to the end, every lifecycle aspect, which from their point of view also includes the software development lifecycle. Uh, and uh, many of vendors and also IT customers and, and uh, mm -hmm. users have, have signed this code of PLM openness and say, yes, we, we need this collaboration, we need this openness, we need this uh, connectivity between the different products we are using in our life cycle. And, and OSLC and some other standards are seen as an, an, an appropriate approach to implement the CPO. So CPO as an, as an idea, as a vision, uh, and also see as a nice, a, a nice counterpart to, to be used in order to make this happen. So 
therefore we decided to partner with the with the ProStep organization. The nice thing is also with the growing success of OSLC, we do not have to go out there and, and look for many organizations. Meanwhile, other organizations also see the value of partnering with us. So that's how this was done in this case. ProStep approached us and said, oh, I think if we, have, we have looked at OSLC for a while, and I think now the time, time is right that we should do something together. And what we are planning is a series of, of activities. The first thing is our first uh, joint conference we are, we are, uh, are about to set up for in, in October, which will be hosted in, uh, by, by Daimler in, in Stuttgart, Germany, where we are talking about interoperability based on OSLC in the context of uh, PLM, but also other engineering uh, challenges uh, there. And, and this should go on, and we will keep this, this going also with other organizations. So we have also partner, uh, partnered in the past with, with uh, uh, INCOSI, with, with OMG, where we have a work group running uh, for model-based uh, uh, system engineering with OSLC. And uh, we are also doing some other activities, especially bringing the different engineering disciplines together and we just relaunched this week the, the ALM-PLM user group because there was a lot of interest and questions to the community. How can we get those different engineering disciplines closer together and we have the platform to discuss the issues we have and that's the ALM-PLM interoperability workgroup with, which is hosted on openservices.net and also meets on a regular basis to discuss customer demands, needs for integrations in engineering environments. Thanks, Rainer. That I think that really just highlight, and obviously in a brief um, five-minute uh, segue, you couldn't share everything that we're doing, uh, OSLC is doing, but it shows you the importance of getting um, uh, OSLC groups together and sharing information, because one of the great things that comes out of the ALM-PLM working group uh, is, the, is the connections and the people, and they share some great ideas about things that they're making successful as in Increasingly, software becomes a, a important, increasingly important aspect of uh, of products around the world, Internet of Things, uh, etc. Thanks, Raina. That was uh, really, really useful, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure everybody got a lot out of that. So let's um, let's talk about something completely different now. So what we've heard so far is we've talked a little. John introduced OSLC and reminded everybody of what what this is, what OSLC is, and where it's going at a sort of at a at a very strategic level. And then we moved into some success stories: Ericsson, IBM, Tastop, Mentographics, Airbus. Uh, really interesting stories about how they can uh, how they're using uh, either commercially providing services around OSLC to connect the processes of uh, both systems engineering systems development. Development and IT um, to make make customers more successful, or how those those organisations like Ericsson and Airbus are taking advantage of RSLC to glue together their very complex tool chains. Um, then Raina talked a little bit about the importance of working with other groups. Talked about ProStep and the systems engineering community, and uh, and that leads us very nicely into some work that we've just kicked off. That's a little bit not totally formed yet, but really, and it, it the title of the work is Integration Patterns Working Group. Really, because. What we've found is that a lot of the stuff in OSLC has been incredibly successful um, in providing these technical standards around linked data in particular, but providing some great protocols and ideas to share and learn some gotchas around connecting um, data across um, systems development and software development projects. But unfortunately, what I've also found is that that isn't necessarily as accessible to human beings. One of the ideas that John highlighted was OSLC is a community for people with integration, lifecycle integration challenges to discuss life cycle integration problems you know that they're trying to connect you know their, their requirements management tool to their test tool like Ian talked a lot about you know some very complex tools that I know very little about but I know about requirements management and and connecting that to some sort of parameter sort of stuff you know which uh, around uh, some engineering or electrical engineering tools um, you need to you need to you've got these particular problems
problems today. And, and uh, OSLC hasn't necessarily done a fantastic job of communicating these ideas and principles, getting these people to work together so they can share best practice and advice, not necessarily always get to the, the ultimate solution because everybody works in a constrained world, but share how they did it so that everybody can learn. And that brought us to this idea that really what we need to provide really is this mechanism to allow people with problems and tools that they're using uh, with ways of using them, processes that are implementing, to really better talk about this in, a, in an organized uh, sort of way, how they may be solving aspects of these problems today, maybe they're not solving certain things and there's a great opportunity for a, a company like Testop or Mentor Graphics to get involved, or always looking, or IBM get involved to, to, you know, to help them be successful, or maybe more importantly, that they're, they're solving these problems using particular technology combinations, and so being able to learn together. And so one of the, the idea was that we would create this idea of an integration, life cycle integrations patterns working group. And really that patterns working group would focus on helping people get solutions, share solutions to particular problems for their particular tools. Now, that doesn't mean that every pattern would be applicable to every situation. It actually means that really what we're doing is sharing best practices or ideas around the community and having examples to do that and showing how certain technologies te technologies can help and the idea of a pattern uh, obviously everybody talks a lot about patterns ever since we did architectural patterns and the gang of four with Eric Gamma etc is really to provide some sort of common solutions some some best practices around maybe for instance I have defects in three tools how do I re how do I reconcile that you know how do I get uh, a return on investment for reconciling it what's the value of getting these things to work together how do I you know what do I do around you know being able to get access you know we talked about delegated UI we talked about Rich Hover earlier we talked about synchronization. Where do those things make sense? And let's provide some examples for that. So the idea of this group is it will do that. And one, and I'll briefly talk about this very briefly, is a pattern that we've been playing with and using as an example, which isn't an engineering pattern, because you may have thought from listening to everybody talk today that this OSLC is all about engineering and product development but it's also about software development and IT organizations and in IT there's a lot of people and a lot of organizations dealing with scaled agile framework trying to connect their PMO with these agile development teams and, and SAFE seems to become popular and so we've been working uh, on defining some patterns, some standard ways of connecting up things like portfolio management to team planning, to talk about how execution management can relate to resource allocation and investment planning. And so this is just one very simple example of a pattern around the investment planning and how that then maps to the program planning. You see that pattern around executive planning to program definition. The only reason why I mention it isn't to encourage you all to look at SAFE, though it's a fantastic way of managing Agile and driving Agile into your enterprise. It's a point that there's opportunity to uh, bring both IT and systems patterns, integration patterns together so that we can start thinking about how we can connect up these systems so we can start building solutions together as a community. Um, so that, that was the only one that I wanted to show you. Uh, obviously, there's some tools. This is an example using Clarity and Rally, bringing those things together and showing how those artifacts link and how those OSLC links fit into that um, with the real artifact names. I'm not going to bore you with that. I know time is, is of an essence and how information flows up and down the chain. So the point is, though, we're kicking off this working group to look at lifecycle integration patterns. Everybody on this call will be uh, who signed up for this webinar will be invited. We'd love you to, you know, if you're at a cocktail party and somebody's talking about lifecycle integration, say, hey, have you thought about joining this working group? We're trying to get people together that really have some of the, that have got these problems, maybe some of the solutions, and trying to work through how we as a group can share this practice with with a broader community. 
And what's interesting about this, and this is the last slide on this that I'll just share with you, is that it's highlighted the fact that integration is complex and that you've got these many layers. So one of the outcomes of the Patterns Working Group might be that we rethink about how OSLC, not is, because there's lots of things that it is, but how it positions itself, how it, what its information architecture is for sharing this kind of information with a broader community. The power of the OSLC group and the community that supports it is we have the opportunity to do anything that we want to share best practice and to share the ideas around lifecycle integration. And this might be one way that we that we that we do it. So as a super fast delivery around what we're doing with respect to the lifecycle uh, integration patterns working group uh, or uh, LIP as it's known for short. <laughs> um, not sure if that's a good uh, an, uh, acronym or not. But and, um, hopefully today you've seen that this sort of fits into a broader story around all the exciting things that are happening with OSLC and some of the interesting stuff. You've heard customer success, you've, uh, you've heard how we're connecting with our groups, you've heard a little bit about some of the working groups that are in action. Feel free to go to the, uh, the resources on, uh, on uh, uh, openservices.net. But I just want to bring John back in to really um, kind of call you all to action. Picture Winston Churchill now with a, with a, with a cigar, encouraging everybody to come out and, 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 uh, and do their bit. So John, um, do you want to sort of leave the audience with some, some takeaways? Well, hopefully we can all catch our breath. I mean, it has been a whirlwind tour here for the, for the last hour, but there's lots of things to do. This isn't just a talking point. This is the reality that we're all in, and we have these challenges. And I'd like us to think about how we would like to make progress individually to, to collectively move the world forward. Uh, the first category of area of progress is one is in just defining and supporting tool integration. You might say that's more focused on vendors, but it's not. It's anyone who would like to help move the industry forward in that way. Uh, the steering committee is going to be having elections this fall. It's OASIS synchronizes all the elections for all of the member sections. So anyway, that's going to be happening in September. Details will show up from OASIS in August, and we'll get those published. But the thought is that uh, first half of September will be nominations and then the elections themselves in the latter half. And you could be involved in that if that's something that you would like to do. Um, the technical committees are open to participation, and uh, consider that. That's something that's intriguing. Or if you like the hands-on aspect of um, building some of the test suites and reference implementations, consider contributing to LEO. Now, all of us are using tools. And so thinking about the tools and how they come together and uh, how they integrate, uh, that's another place to focus, either for you um, or um, in your conversation with your vendors, encourage them to get involved in this discussion um, about how their integrations can be uh, improved and be made uh, to, to play well uh, with, with more uh, other parts of the tool chain. And the third, uh, general area here is to let's just talk. And uh, there's a range of places. Uh, Reiner and Dave have both talked about uh, opportunities, lifecycle integration patterns, and ALM, PLM interoperability. So there's definitely opportunities in both of those, but there's other ones. We have forums for you to be able to ask questions, but also answer questions. You can participate in either way, share thoughts, um, and just do what, do what makes sense here. Uh, and uh, do your part of moving the integration world forward. We, it's one of these cases we're dependent on each other and appreciate the contribution that everyone can make. Thank you. Thanks, John. So one, one question that that's, there's a couple of questions that have come up, but one in particular is, so, you know, I'd like to contribute, I'd like to be part of it, but how much effort is is it really? I mean, do you expect, you know, is it like five hours a week? Is it 20 minutes a week? Is it every other week spending an hour? Is it every month spending an hour? How can I contribute? John, you, you know, you've been involved from the, from the start and you've seen many different levels of contribution. What, how can people get involved and what kind of level of contribution would, would you expect? Or, or I think there's a one size fits all answer to that. Dave, but, but rather the situation is, what is your area of interest and how much can you contribute? Now, if you're uh, working on the uh, LEO project, I'm thinking that, that would be um, 
an hour here or there as you have opportunity to work on it. If you're involved in one of the user groups, that would be an ongoing interaction um, monthly, probably of an hour or two. Uh, the steering committee meets every month, and we get together uh, for a pretty intense conversation and also have offline work in between. So that would be a, another level of an involvement. The technical committee is busy much more, and so they'd be interacting weekly. Um, to, to biweekly. So again, depending on the area of interest and the amount of the amount of time you have, it, it kind of would help you calibrate the amount of opportunity and the the range of the investment. Time investment. So, and and I think that the other thing is, even if you've only got twenty minutes, and you say, uh, uh, you just to write some comment on a on one of the forums about your experiences doing some you know integration or whatever, that's the that that's good as well. You know, whether it's more formal or less formal, I guess what we and the committee, you know, all on the um, on the line here, I really want to say is that we're trying to build an inclusive community that talks about lifecycle integration and learns from each other, so that we connect this well. You know, software and systems is only going to get harder and more complex. You know, there's but there's more opportunity, whether it be a talking car uh, like Knight Rider, if you remember the TV show, or whether it be taking a man to, the, to Mars. You know, so software is incredibly complex. Systems are incredibly complex and incredibly interesting. And as we build these complex tools chains supporting them, we all need to get better at it. And that's really what the OSLC community is. We're trying to build that community so that everybody, whether you have 20 minutes or whether you have a day a week, can contribute and help us get better as an industry for, for, for delivering uh, and supporting these life cycles. Now, we've come up to the hour. Uh, I know everybody's got a, probably a back-to-back -back meeting, so I don't want to um, take any more of your precious time. I'd like to thank everybody that presented today, the steering committee and, uh, and additions, Ludmilla and Ian. Thank you for spending time out of your busy, hectic work days to contribute to today's presentation. Uh, for the people that are online, feel free, you know, feel free to email and to, uh, and to get on in the discussions. There's lots of places to do that on openservices.net. And also, um, people that attended will be sending out a recording, so feel free to, to spread the word and send this to other people so they can fast forward through my very boring sections and, and spend more time listening to smart people like John and the customer success stories and Rainer, etc. So, um, feel free to, uh, to ping us. Hopefully, you're integrating every day, and hopefully, we can help you get better at it. Thank you for your time, and have a, have a great day.